Good afternoon, everybody, or whatever time it is where you are. We are picking up in Luke chapter 4 for our Bible study today. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 to begin with. Finally out of chapter 3 in that genealogy and all the <laughs> complexities that were there. Now we're going to talk about Jesus' temptation. It's easy to remember what chapters Jesus' temptation are in because it's in Luke 4 and it's also in Matthew 4. And I definitely encourage you to read both accounts because each gives some unique details about the events that, that took place. And so let's read verses, Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. So remember where Jesus was before this. The last time we read about Jesus, he was ba being baptized by John the Baptist at the Jordan River. So it talk that's why it mentions here that he returned from the Jordan. <clears throat> I want to take a moment and just notice the significant amount of work that the Holy Spirit has done and how Luke has featured him in his gospel up to this point. You know, I know a lot of times when we Christians, might, and might, you know, I'm guilty of this as well, when we talk about God, we sometimes highlight God the Father and, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit is kind of like the forgotten member of the Trinity sometimes, as if you know, he, he hasn't been working all this time as well. But the beginning of Luke's Gospel is a great illustration of how much work the Spirit has done uh, here, but really through the ages. Luke has mentioned in, <clears throat> in chapter 1, verse 15, how John the Baptist was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit created Jesus, conceived Jesus inside of Mary's womb miraculously in chapter 1, verse 35. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit when she was talking to Mary and blessing Mary. It's not specifically stated, but I think it is implied that in turn Mary was filled with the Holy Spirit when she made that uh, statement of praise to God when she was there at Elizabeth's house when they greeted one another. Zechariah prophesied by the Holy Spirit at John's birth. That's at the end of chapter 1. Simeon, remember that guy who Mary and Joseph met in Jerusalem? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus, was, uh, Jesus was, was going to be baptizing with the Holy Spirit. John has already mentioned that. The Holy Spirit descended on Jesus at his baptism. And then verse chapter 4, verse 1 tells us that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit after his baptism and during his ministry. And so there's a lot of discussion here. So definitely don't discount the work of the third member of the Godhead. But after his baptism, Jesus went into the wilderness to endure this period of persecution. And the devil was going to tempt him when he was there. and said that he fasted for 40 days and he didn't have anything to eat. And this seems to be in preparation for his this, this period of temptation. But Jesus was God, but he was also a man. And as far as we know, he had the same cravings and passions and desires as any man, so would have struggled with temptation like other men. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says that he was tempted in the same ways that we are tempted. Satan wanted to tempt Jesus because if he could get Jesus to give in to temptation and sin, then Jesus wouldn't be able to fill the role as God's perfect sacrifice for sin any longer. You know, that's what he had come to do. He was going to redeem mankind. In order to do that, he had to be the Lamb of God without blemish, without sin stains on him. If Satan could get him to sin, though, he could thwart that whole plan. So it would have been uh, uh, high on his priority list, list to make this happen. So he's going to give it an attempt here, but we'll see how it turns out. I just thought of some things that we can take away from this scene in terms of modern religious life. You know, in other religions, it might be possible to believe that your god or maybe your gods can't understand what it's like to be a human. And you might even be right and, and fair and just in kind of leveling the accusation that, you know, well, well how can God expect things of us? He doesn't, he doesn't know what it's like to be us. He's never experienced the kind of things that I struggle with. Uh, and so how is it fair that he gets to judge me? 
However, within Christianity, and, and this is a good thing for us, we're not going to be able to make that accusation of God. Because Jesus came to earth, he lived among the people that he created and experienced their difficulties and their sufferings. He knows what it's like to be us. And because of that, he's not only better equipped to help us, right, but also he's in a position where if judgment is given at the end, well, it will be given at the end of time to those who rejected the Lord. You know, they're not going to be able to look God in the face and say, well, you know what, you never knew what it was like to be me. Another thought I had from this was that some religions actually consider the idea that Jesus came down and became a man like blasphemy. I think Islam really looks down on that idea, like God would never debase himself to the point of doing that. But when one understands that it was God coming into our world to relate to us and to love us, it becomes something beautiful and it's something unique about the Christian faith. I think we all want to serve a God who knows what it's like to be us. You want to serve a God who knows what it's like to be you. And we just touched on that a little bit. But consider like your boss at work. I don't know if you have a good boss or a bad boss. I was always blessed to have pretty good bosses. But you, you don't want a boss who sits over in like a corner office somewhere uh, in the C-level suite uh, who doesn't know you, doesn't talk to you, doesn't ask for your input, and yet makes a bunch of rules that directly relate to you and what you're doing. You, do, you don't want that. You want a boss who knows what it's like to be you, to be in your shoes, to know the things that uh, make your job easier and make them more difficult and to implement rules that reflect that understanding. Jesus isn't some kind of distant deity off <laughs> making up rules in heaven that he hasn't considered or he hasn't been walking in your shoes when creating, right? He is a relatable savior. And that is a really beautiful fact uh, and a real beautiful truth of the Christian faith. So Jesus, in preparation for this temptation, he fasted 40 years in the wilderness in preparation. And I think there's a takeaway for us there as well in terms of fasting. Now, the New Testament, it doesn't give us any direct commands to fast, but it does imply that there are benefits associated with fasting. And we see some of the uh, leaders of the early church fasting, like when big decisions had to be made or they were you know, prepping for some, some big event or for a uh, sending Paul out on his, his missionary journeys, if I remember correct, in Acts chapter 13. They fasted before doing that. Uh, and so we do see that this is kind of highlighted, and it's often coupled with prayer. So people would pray, and they would fast at the same time. You notice how uh, verse 2 specifically says that, <laughs> that Jesus was hungry after he fasted for 40 days. And I always read that, and I'm like, well, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so, I, hungry was probably an understatement, <laughs> but... I, I do want to point out an application from this fasting that we can take away, and that is that physical strength is not necessarily equivalent to spiritual strength. You see how Jesus sacrificed his physical health f to prepare himself for the spiritual battle that was coming. And while I don't think the Bible is necessarily calling us to fast for 40 days, I do wonder how many of us have ever even considered this when in need of spiritual guidance or, or when facing a trial or just on an, you know, an everyday, day-to-day -day basis, that preparation for spiritual things is more important than preparation in the physical sense. You know, we're busy and our busyness often leads us to have very little time for any kind of spiritual application or prayer or you know, feeding off of the Word of God. And I think one principle from this is that we would be wise to skip a meal, or maybe going to the gym, or caring for ourselves in some physical way to prioritize our spiritual selves. And I just wonder, you know, how many of us have ever even considered that? You know, at the end of my day, if, you know, it's almost bedtime and maybe I have to get up early the next morning, and I realize, oh, okay, I haven't eaten dinner, but I also haven't studied or I haven't prayed, Truth, truthfully, for me, just me personally, I'm probably going to eat dinner, 
right? And then I'll just say, well, I'll pray and I'll study tomorrow. Jesus gives us, and, and I think the Bible as a whole teaches us that Jesus' life, especially in the, the sacrifices that he made in terms of sleep and other things, to pursue his spiritual priorities, it teaches us that, that maybe we should be thinking differently. You know, maybe we ought to skip the meal to the physical meal to eat a spiritual meal and study or to commune with God in prayer that night, that that would actually be, should be our top priority. So, you know, I'm not saying you have to fast all the time and skip meals and skip going to the gym and skip doing things that are physically beneficial for you. But just think about that, you know, next time that choice confronts you. And it's probably a new way of thinking for a lot of us, and, and including myself. All right, verses... Uh, Oh, I think actually for today's video, we'll stop right here. And then we're going to get into Jesus's temptation. There's going to be three big temptations that Jesus faces. And we will talk about the first two in the next video and then the last one after that. So I'll see you guys then.